I'll just start by saying that this is an area that's uh, rather ripe for tax controversy because of the uh, many tax authorities are, are somewhat unfamiliar with the business models and the concepts. And in addition to that, we also have the, uh, the fact that the OECD in the BEPS discussion has started to focus on you know, companies operating in the digital economy. And so that the sort of confluence of those two things make this a rather <coughs> controversial area. Uh, and the other point to start off with introductory is that the, the issues that we're going to discuss today are relevant not just to the providers of cloud computing services, but also to the customers. Uh, because often the question will become, you know, what is the character of the payments? Is there an obligation to withhold by the customer? And, uh, you know, in recent years we've seen quite an advancement in, in cloud computing. Uh, and this is really due to the increase of the use of cloud and the underlying sort of technology and infrastructure that's improved in the last few years. Uh, just yesterday I read an article in the, the New York Times about how Amazon, IBM, and Dell and a few other companies will be making significant multi-billion dollar investments in their cloud infrastructure in the coming year. And while the, the term cloud computing is, is a relatively recent one, the concepts underlying it have actually been around for, for some time, although they were described differently in, in the past. If you go back actually and look at the OECD's TAG e-commerce report from 2001, uh, you'll see that it describes 24 transactions, including application hosting, uh, data warehousing, website hosting, that, you know, today, components of which comprise what we now call cloud computing. So actually, the, uh, I think the TAG report from 2001 provides a rather good framework for analyzing today's uh, transactions, cloud computing transactions. And then that brings us to, you know, what is, what is cloud computing exactly? And there's a definition that is often cited, provided by the uh, U.S. National Institutes of Standards and Technology, which says that cloud computing is a model for enabling ubiquitous, convenient, on-demand access to a shared pool of configurable computer resources, such as networks, servers, storage, applications, and services, that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management efforts or the service provider interaction. And some of the characteristics that, that are included are, you know, on-demand self-service, so that there's really no uh, human interaction with the service provider, uh, broad network access, so that you have a use by a variety of client devices, uh, resource pooling, that means that you can serve multiple customers in what they call a multi-tenant model, uh, multi, multiple customers using the technology at the same time, or the resources at the same time. Rapid elasticity, which means that the resources can be dynamically assigned or reassigned in response to customer demand. And then a measured services, uh, the resource use is metered depending on the amount of data or processing power or bandwidth. Um, and cloud computing generally falls within three business models. There's infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and then software as a service. Uh, infrastructure as a service is basically you're just providing the resource to the hardware, uh, the servers, the processing power. There's no software uh, that is being provided by the cloud provider. Things would like, you know, data hosting and storage. And then you have platform as a service, which layers onto the uh, infrastructure as a service, except now you have a development platform so that the customer is able to uh, create its own applications using the infrastructure and the operating system. And then finally, there's, infrastructure, there's software as a service, which is the, the customer is now provided with applications uh, that is provided by the provider's hardware and software. Uh, things like, if you think, you know, common, common ones that users would be using are things like uh, Google Apps or Microsoft Office 365. Uh, but there are also more enterprise level ones like uh, customer relationship management software, sales automation, and accounting systems. So those are the three, three business models. But what's important to bear in mind as we go through analyzing the transactions for tax purposes is that in all of the cases that we've just discussed, there's no portion of the core software is, is ever downloaded to the customer, um, except for a very small amount of scripting code that enables the customer to sign on to the website. 
but the customer doesn't have any access to the actual uh, copyrighted material um, in terms of you know the, the underlying rights, the copyright rights. So turning to this tax issue specifically, now characterization is, is really quite a key issue for tax purposes um, and, and will, will have implications for a lot of the tax issues that we're about to discuss. In the treaty context, the question is often you know, whether the income generates royalties that could be subject to withholding or whether it's business profits that's not taxable by the source country uh, in the absence of a permanent establishment. What you'll find is many tax authorities will try to assert a royalty characterization so that they can impose the withholding tax. Um, the related question that comes up in the characterization question is that of bifurcation of the income. Uh, should, even if, even if the, the tax authorities can tax some portion of the income, break out some portion of the income as constituting a royalty on which they can impose a withholding tax, you're finding more tax authorities today are taking the position that, okay, even though there may be some services here, there are also some component that is a royalty that should be subject to withholding tax. So you get into these disputes between taxpayers and the government about whether you should be trying to bifurcate the income into multiple components or whether you should look at the predominant character of the income. So, depending on the particular transaction that we're looking at, some of the possibilities for characterization include, you know, sale, license, lease, or services. And there are rules that are in place uh, in many countries to try and determine what the proper classification of the income is. In the U.S., we have regulations under 861-18 that are purported to classify transactions involving computer software. Uh, many other countries have adopted similar rules. Singapore and Malaysia have recently announced uh, similar rules. The, the problem with some of these rules is they were uh, published at a time where, you know, in the case of Dash 8, the regulations in the U.S., for example, in 1996, where some of these models that are now being used today have not, were not prevalent. And so, uh, you know, the, some of the, the law hasn't really kept up with the evolving business models, and that's one of the issues that, that we face. And so tax authorities around the world are, are starting to, you know, as I say, look into this and try to develop new rules for the evolving business models and have asked for, you know, comments from the public and, and we're assisting in that regard. It's, it's, important, it's important for companies to start helping the, the tax authorities understand their business models so that we can have rules that are, uh, you know, hopefully administrable.